I'm Jillian Finley. The Fifth Estate starts now. He said he rolled into the water. But there's no sign of the weeds being trampled down. It started with a hunch. I think somebody done him wrong. A police investigation that didn't seem to add up. This should have been classified as a suspicious death until it was proven to be different. In Thunder Bay, a city with a long history of racial mistrust. They're saying, oh, he's just a drunk Indian. With so many questions, we went looking for answers and found some. You were one of the last people that was with Stacy. So what happened to him? What does it say that your officers haven't spoken to them? What does that say about the investigation? From the beginning, water has been the lifeblood of the northern Ontario city of Thunder Bay. But what water has brought this community, it has also taken away. In the last decade and a half, more than a dozen people have been found dead in Thunder Bay's rivers, most of them indigenous, five of them just teenagers. In each of those cases, Thunder Bay's police quickly determined the deaths, not crimes, but accidents, no foul play. But today, a similar conclusion in a similar drowning is stirring old tensions. It started last October. She had a strange look on her face. And she said, I got bad news. She said, it, they found Stacy in the river. Stacy DeBungie was 41 from the small First Nations community of Rainy River. He'd lived in Thunder Bay for more than a decade on a disability pension. He was a comedian. He was a happy-go-lucky guy, like, and he was talkative. He'd make you laugh just by his, by his stories that he'd tell. He was last seen alive the evening of October 18th. He'd made a purchase at the liquor store and walked a few hundred meters to the banks of the McIntyre River. At 9.30 the next morning, his body was discovered in the weeds, face down. Brad DeBungie is Stacy's older brother. What did you think when you, when she told you they'd found him in the river? I was in shock, because uh, he said he never hung around that area. So that made me wonder. How did he end up there? Brad only got the news the next day. When he tried getting answers from Thunder Bay's police about what had happened at the river, he says he got the runaround. They were, like, brushing me off, like they wouldn't really give me no answers to anything. And I said, so what kind of investigation you got going? And he said, oh, it's still open. That's it, we're just looking into it. That's what the police told him, but publicly, the Thunder Bay Police Service was making it sound like the investigation was all but over. Barely three hours after finding the body, before Stacy had even been identified, police issued a press release. The death did not appear suspicious. A day later, before there'd even been an autopsy, there was another release. Police had deemed Debungi's death non-criminal. But based on what? When Brad couldn't get answers at the police station, he went to check the riverbank himself. And who showed up but one of the detectives? Then he said it was over here in the water. Right over and here. What did the police tell you their theory was then? Uh, that he was passed out here. And how did they figure he got to the water? They said he rolled into the water. But there's no sign of the weeds being trampled down. Brad's suspicions only grew when he saw his brother's body at the funeral parlor. This is what kind of made me suspicious. Like it's not a really a drowning. 
because his nose is off center mm -hmm. and his cheek is puffed out and there's a bruise underneath his eye. This shows the, that his nose is bent from a different angle. It looks like there was something else done to him. It wasn't just the Debungi family. The whole First Nations community was asking questions. Rainy River Chief Jim Leonard. And the more I talked to them, the more uh, concern I began to have. And um, to a point where it, it angered me. Just the way uh, the family was treated, the more they showed and the more they talked, the more concern I began to have. So Chief Leonard decided to hire his own investigator. For 27 years, Dave Perry was a detective with Toronto's police service, decorated for his work in homicides and major crimes. I found it quite shocking. Shocking because of how quickly Thunder Bay's police had concluded the Bungie's death was not a crime. If you were to take the checklist, which is quite an extensive one, on what you have to do for a death investigation before you can make a determination, if you will, like they did 24 hours later in the newspaper, that no foul play is suspected, the work is tremendous. It can take weeks, it can take months, it can take a year. It's a tremendous amount of work. So Perry went to work himself, traveling to Thunder Bay, talking to anyone who remembered seeing Stacy, retracing his last movements. You know, I went and I visited the scene where Mr. DeBungie's body was recovered. And this was a very calm, peaceful part of the river. It was very shallow uh, at the riverbank, so it's not like depth was a, an extreme issue. And we all know that people can drown in a couple of inches of water, and if they're incapacitated by anything, um, they, they can drown very easily. But it's, it's such an easy explanation, rather than to put the, the kind of effort that you're supposed to in a sudden death investigation to assure families that they actually have answers to what happened to their loved one, and, and again, simply wasn't done here. The one piece of information police had shared with the Debungi family was that Stacy was not alone that night. There was evidence at least one other man had been on the riverbank too. They said they found his ID scattered in that area. And they said uh, they haven't really looked for him because he says he doesn't want to be found because he's got warrants out for him. So they weren't even bothering to look for no. him? That's what they told you? Yeah. They should have been looking for that man, says Dave Perry. The ID was clearly an important clue, especially given what else he was learning. I started to hear things about other people being there at the time. I started hearing things about a potential conflict and perhaps even a fight between Stacy DeBungi and another gentleman. In fact, Detective Perry would learn there were at least four people drinking with Stacy that night. Four potential witnesses, maybe even people who were involved. It didn't take him long to figure out who those people were, and then he discovered something disturbing. The debit card Stacy had used earlier in the day was missing. Even more disturbing, he found out that that card had been used again six more times after Stacy DeBungie's body had been found. There were three withdrawals at ATMs and purchases at the liquor store, at a Canadian tire, and with a taxi company. When I found that out, some alarm bells went off because potentially there's a motive here for a crime. We could have a robbery, and that robbery could have led to the death of Stacy DeBungie. And I'm not saying that that's a fact, mm -hmm. but these are questions that all have to be answered and they have to be excluded if they're not true. All these leads that, that you were able to determine, how quickly did you put those together? Work time about 48 hours. You got, figured all this out in 48 hours? Yes. And the police, they hadn't figured any of that out? You know, to the best of my knowledge, they hadn't. And that's what causes me a lot of concern. So in an act of professional courtesy and with Brad DeBungi in tow, Perry went to Thunder Bay's police headquarters to share what he knew. I asked him to have the officers in charge of the case to, to give me a call that I may be able to share some information with them and shed some light on a few things. And I never got a, a call or a response whatsoever. So they knew who you were. They knew what your experience was. They knew was. who I was, yes. And, and you were telling them that you had information that you thought they as investigators should know. Right. 
and they never called you back? I felt like I just interrupted this gentleman's day. It, he didn't take me seriously. He certainly didn't treat uh, Brad DeBungie the way I think a surviving victim should be treated. Why and do you think that didn't happen? Well, I think that there, there may be a, a component of sort of a, a racist approach to the investigation. And when I say that, another intoxicated indigenous person found in the river, therefore we know what's happened. This is just simply a drowning. And that's, that's the, a dead wrong approach and it's completely improper. It's also troublesome because as we would find out, there was still lots to be discovered about what happened to Stacy DeBungie that night and questions about how hard police had even tried. This is your town, your investigators. Right. And you say you didn't hear about any of it until you read his report? That's correct, yeah. Stacy DeBungie was not the first indigenous person to be found dead in Thunder Bay's rivers. Last year, a long-delayed inquest was finally held into the deaths of seven teenagers dating back more than a decade. One of the largest inquests in this province's history gets underway this morning in Thunder Bay. It will look into the circumstances surrounding Five the deaths of seven Five drowned in local waterways. Two were found dead in their rooms. In a city where they faced racism, loneliness, and lack of support. In each case, police had quickly labeled the deaths non-criminal. The same words used over and over again. No foul play suspected. Did you accept that? No, I didn't. Dora Morris testified at the inquest. Her nephew, Jethro Anderson, was one of those pulled from the river. Her frustration with police started with her first call to report him missing telling me that he's out there partying like any other Native kid. Those kind of comments. He's out there partying like yeah. any other Native kid? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So therefore, don't worry? Is that what they were saying? From the sound of it, like, like it seemed to me that they didn't really care what was going on. Like, he, he was only, he just turned 15. I was hoping that they would just uh, jump right away to start searching. That's what she did, scouring the streets day and night. But as she would learn at the inquest, it was six days before police even opened an investigation into Jethro's disappearance. 13 days before they agreed to drag the river. I don't know what they would have done if it's not a First Nation kid, but when something happens to a First Nation people, then more, more like they just slept it under the rug. Coroner's jury in Thunder Bay delivered its findings today and made 145 Wrapped recommendations. After nine months of testimony from nearly 150 witnesses. Technically, how police had handled the investigations wasn't part of the inquest mandate, but there was no escaping scrutiny. The jury ruled three of the drownings, including Jethro Anderson's, could not be labeled accidents for sure. Undetermined was the conclusion, which leaves open the possibility there might indeed have been foul play. Then came Stacy DeBungi, found dead even as the inquest was sitting, and yet once again the quick rush to declare no crime. What shocks me is that all of this happened, or to be put properly, didn't happen, in the middle of an inquest where the Thunder Bay police were under a microscope being reviewed for the exact same issue that we're sitting here talking about today. To me, I can't believe that this would happen, and I can't believe that the leadership would let this happen. If I was the chief of that police service, I'd be personally down at that crime scene to make sure that we didn't miss a single thing. Chief Levesque, I'm Jillian Finley. Nice to meet Pleasure you. to meet you. J.P. Levesque has been Thunder Bay's police chief for five years. I started our conversation by asking him to explain those early press releases. Three hours after Mr. DeBungie's body was found, the Thunder Bay police issued a press release saying that the initial investigation does not indicate suspicious death. Mm -hmm. Within a day, another press release saying that the police had deemed the death non-criminal. How did you know that? Yeah. 
I think the wording of the, the press release could have been better. I think it should have been something more along the lines of, uh, based on the evidence we have at hand to date, there does not appear to be any foul play. Uh, we didn't add that, and certainly it was a learning lesson for us. It, what, it, what was the investigation that was done within those first 24 hours that would lead you to any kind of conclusion? The scene, the condition of the body, all those types of things. It should have said, based on the evidence we had at that time. So it, it was a mistake on our part. There's no question about it. We then asked him about that missing man, the ID cards that officers had found on the riverbank, surely an important clue. What efforts were made to find the man to whom that ID belonged? From what I recall of the investigation, efforts were made to locate him. Uh, mail was put out for location. I believe we attended his last known uh, residence, uh, left information that we needed to speak with this individual, and could he please contact us? And did you hear from him? Um, later on in the investigation, I believe we, f we spoke to him. Because the family says they were told that this was somebody who did not want to be found by police and had simply disappeared. I, you know what, I can't comment on that. I, I really don't have any knowledge of that. In his investigation, retired Toronto police detective Dave Perry identified four people who were with Stacy that night two of whom disappeared from Thunder Bay in the days that followed. To him, there was plenty to investigate, and he still can't figure out why it wasn't, especially since his report was handed to Thunder Bay police this summer, including his very different conclusion. This should have been classified as a suspicious death, until, if and until, it was proven to be different. And the only way you can prove it to be different is to do an extremely thorough investigation. You can't rely on biases. I mean, Mr. Perry is a, a uh, respected investigator. Um, he was able to access information, my understanding, he was able to access information that we wouldn't have been able to access without a warrant. So... Um, Why didn't you go get a warrant? We likely wouldn't have been able to get a warrant. And there was no reason for us to think that we had to get a warrant. Mr. Perry spent 48 hours in Thunder Bay, and in that time, he finds four people who were the last people to be with and to have seen Mr. Debungi that night. Did you find those four people? I know we spoke to witnesses. He also finds that Mr. Debungi's debit card mm -hmm. is missing, and he further finds that that debit card was used after his death. Did you know about that debit card? I don't believe the family shared that with us, no. This is your town, your investigators, right. and you say you didn't hear about any of it until you read his report? That's correct, yeah. What does that say to you as the man responsible for investigations in Thunder Bay? Um, I think that there's a certain level of cooperation that Mr. Perry maybe was able to get that we weren't. Have you not gone back to those investigators and said, did you ever ask about the debit card? Did you ever interview these people? I try not to micromanage. I'll, I'll let the investigators do their job. But they didn't do the job in this case. Mm. Would you agree with that? They didn't do the job. Uh, no, I wouldn't agree with that. I, I don't know that they had the grounds to obtain the information that Mr. Perry was able to obtain. But Perry says it wasn't grounds they needed, it was initiative. There are key people that need to be found and need to be interviewed and figure out, you know, did that debit card have something to do with Stacey DeBungie's death or did it not? That's a, that's a question that's going to be gnawing at me until somebody steps up and actually does an investigation and figures this out. So we decided to see what we could find out. Armed with Dave Perry's report, we went looking for people we knew had information to share. It didn't take us long to find someone important. Kathleen Quandabins was Stacy DeBungie's stepdaughter. She didn't want to be interviewed on camera, but she did confirm what she had told Dave Perry that she knew the people Stacy had been with that night, that she'd seen them the next day in possession of his debit card, and that she was suspicious. She also confirmed that in the years since Stacy DeBungie died, Thunder Bay police have never sought her out to ask about any of it. 
From Kathleen, we got more names, including the woman she said had that debit card, Ethel Wobbs. And so we started looking for her too, and one day on a street corner, we found her. You were one of the last people that was with Stacy, right, that night. Yeah. So what happened to him? How did he end up in the room? She didn't want to talk to us at first, but then she reconsidered and led us to her boyfriend, Corey Linkletter. He'd been at the river that night, too. Hi, I'm Jillian. Do you want to just stand back here? If anyone could shed light on what happened to Stacy, it should be these two. We want to talk to you because we're, we're trying to get some answers about Stacy DeBungie. Okay. And you, I think, were the last people to be with him before yeah. he died. Yeah. So what can you tell us about how he died? I don't know. I don't know. He said he was going to be okay. Right. Yeah. I probably have to say. So that's you left him. Some, that's all. That's all that happened. That's all. Stacy was drunk, they yeah. said. They all were. But when they left, they had no reason to think he was in danger. Did you harm him? Did you harm Stacy? Did you get into a fight with him? No. no. There was no fight. No I, I, I couldn't. Nothing. nothing. Did you steal his debit card from him? No. No? No. no. He gave it to you? Yeah. <laughs> Did you use it at the Canadian Tire store? No. Did you use it at the LCBO? Yeah. You did. Stop the LCBO. Did, did you use it with a taxi company? No. No. Why did Why did you have the debit card? Because I went in the LCBO and I forgot to give it back. You forgot to give it back. Many of their answers raised even more questions, things beyond our ability to check out. Was he sleeping? Or not? But one thing Ethel and Corey too made clear. In the last year, no one from Thunder Bay Police has bothered to find and interview them. Within 48 hours of us being in Thunder Bay, we were able to find two people, including the woman who acknowledges that she had Stacy DeBungie's debit card and used it the next day. Okay. Are you willing to be interviewed by our investigators? I don't think you need to interview me. She and, and her partner have not, they say, both say, that they mm -hmm. have not been questioned by the Thunder Bay police. Okay. Nobody has come to talk to them about any of these issues that we've raised here today. I will pass on the information. I wasn't aware of that. And what does that say about the investigation you say is going on? They're willing to make themselves available to you? Well, we didn't, they didn't walk in the door. We went, mm -hmm. and, we went and found them. But it wasn't hard, is the point I'm making. Right. It's an ongoing investigation. I, and I don't know what steps recently the investigators have taken. I haven't been briefed on it in a while. I'll have to look into it. It didn't surprise me at all how much lack of investigation the, the police did. Rainy River First Nations Chief, Jim Leonard. It's just that built up from over the years and the lack of response, the lack of investigation, the lack of of satisfaction uh, that we as Native people have been getting and the treatment we've been getting from the, from the police. It's a decades-old complaint in this city, and it's getting worse. So today, when you walk down the street in this city, do you fear the police? Yes, I do. Yep. Yes. No one ever said policing is easy in a place like Thunder Bay. A few years ago, the city had the highest per capita murder rate in the country, and the tensions are real. One for all days, uh, for day. 82 are off. 25% of the population here is indigenous. People are complaining you're bothering customers. Is that any truth to that? Anybody been drinking at all? Or? And yet, according to some estimates, they account for nearly 80% of arrests. You okay? You okay? Just wait. Just wait. Do you have any idea on you? Yeah, do you eat too much to drink, eh? Tonight, this man just needs a place to sober up. Can you check and see if Detox has a mail bed? We're trying to see if you can go to Detox for the night. Yes, can I please? 
No options available for you right now. You're gonna have to come to the. But the shelters are full, and so he ends up cuffed and taken to jail. To police, it's a last resort. Go for sleep, sober up, and away you go. But to Thunder Bay's indigenous community, it looks and feels like racism. Take what happened in front of the same bar last August. There was an argument that spilled out onto the street, and in the middle of it, a man named Gary Moore. When I left, went outside, some people followed me, and they kept on arguing with me. Then all of a sudden, I got tackled from behind. So what did you do? Uh, just tried to get the person off me. He says he assumed the person on top of him was one of those he'd been arguing with. I was getting punched around, and uh, all I know was I was fighting, fighting back, and that's all I can say. Soon he was on his back, straddled by his attacker. It was only then, he says, he realized with whom he'd been fighting. When they said, uh, pulling out the cuffs, they said, if you don't stop now, we're going to use the taser and the pepper, per pepper spray. So that's when I kind of relaxed. And I'm like, oh, these are cuffs. Gary was arrested, taken to the hospital, and then to the police station, where he claims he was beaten again. So what were your injuries then, as a result of this? I had uh, this, uh, I think like six, seven, uh, seven stitches to my left eye here. Uh, it was all shut. I couldn't see out of it. I had like maybe about 20 bruises on my head. My head was looked like a balloon. Stories like Gary's are often hard to verify, but unbeknownst to him and to the police, there was a bystander with a phone that night. A short video was posted to Facebook the next day. The quality is poor and shot from a distance, but if you look carefully, you can make it out. A man on his back, another straddling him, the flash of a punch. The video has since disappeared from social media, but the Fifth Estate has verified this is indeed part of the incident Gary described. The man on top is indeed a Thunder Bay police officer. Are you familiar with this video I'm talking about? No, I'm sorry, I'm not aware of it. You're not aware of no. this at all? Chief Levesque had not seen the video when we spoke with him, but he agreed that if the incident was as described, it was cause for concern. Is there protocol in this police department that would explain or allow uh, for the fact that a police officer punched a man he was trying to arrest. In the Our base. officers all receive the same training and use of force. Um, without knowing the, you know, what was transpiring at the time, I, I'm not prepared to comment on that. I mean, obviously there's no protocol, as you call it, to punch a defenseless man. Gary says police later told him they were called to the bar after a report that he was drunk and had hit a woman. He denies both things. In the end, he was charged with resisting arrest and assaulting the officer, even though he was the one who got injured. Everywhere we went in Thunder Bay, we heard stories from First Nations people about how they are treated by police. Late last month, we hosted a meeting, invited people to share their stories. Hi, I'm Jillian. Many I'm told Jillian. us they were worried about retaliation. For some, it was the first time they'd talk publicly about their experiences. So I wondered if I could just start by asking you, how many people here have had some kind of interaction with the police in this city in which you felt that racism played a role? I got hit by a car while on my bike. He, there was supposed to be an investigation, but he never called me back like he said he would the next day, and nothing became of this incident. This woman described how she ended up being arrested after witnessing officers harassing a First Nations man. Like they were picking on him, bullying him, and I took notice of that, and I made a verbal... Um, comment to them, like, he's not doing anything, leave him alone. Mm -hmm. 
it instinctively turned on me. And, I, and when I defended myself or spoke back or I was being hauled in, I was arrested right there, put in handcuffs, you know, thrown up against the back of the car and taken in. There was racial slurs the whole, the whole ride, right? Like, you should have stayed on the res, squaw, you're not gonna finish school, you're not gonna mount anything. So today, when you walk down the street in this city, do you fear the police like you? Yes, I do, yep, yes. This woman does too. Her account of her arrest was brutal. And there was about four or five of them that came in. They threw me against the wall and uh, my head hit the wall and made a dent in the wall. They kind of wanted everyone out of the way. The stories were familiar to band counselor Darius Ferris. The, the stories that we hear today. He says he's been hearing them for the years. The stories that we hear out there. It's, it is systemic, systemic racism and uh, stereotype, you know. And for some reason, uh, we First Nations stand out. I think this needs to be exposed more because a cop is supposed to uh, uphold the law, protect and serve right. But how can you uh, trust these individuals that are only abusing their authority? I want to show you some videotape. You asked about uh, the meeting we had last night. Take a listen. I got hit by a car. He, there was supposed to be an investigation, but he never called me back like he said he would the next day. Do you fear the police? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yes. It is systemic, systemic racism. And uh, for some reason, uh, we First Nations stand out. So that's just... Uh, a little bit of what we heard last night. Mm -hmm. What do you think when you listen to that? I'm wondering if you heard anything positive. We heard people say, we don't say every police officer is racist. We accept that there are some who are good, but our experience leads us to this conclusion. Mm -hmm. Systemic racism. This is what happens to us as Indigenous people in this community. Well, <clears throat> I think that if these kinds of claims come forward, they'll be properly investigated. Do I want to know about these things? Absolutely. We, we asked everybody who had an allegation last night, we mm -hmm. said to them, did you go to the police to complain? Mm -hmm. And the, it really boils down to they don't trust the police force right. here. They don't trust you to serve and protect their interests. Do you, do you acknowledge that you have a problem? Yes. Yeah. Well, our relationship within the Indigenous community is not good. Yes, I acknowledge that. I know, though, that we are working very hard to try and change that. I mean, we, ha we have some people who make some poor choices, and there's no question about that. And are they held and, accountable and, and for them? When it comes to our attention. How, how do I do anything if these kinds of stories that you just showed me aren't brought to my attention? Of course, there is one story that has been brought to the police's attention by the family, by an outside investigator, and now by us. The story of Stacy DeBungie. Having initially declared his death non-criminal, the police now say their investigation is ongoing. Though Stacy's brother is skeptical. A year later, Brad is more convinced than ever that what happened here was no accident. So what did you think? Like somebody placed him there? Like they just threw him in the water and that'd be it. I think somebody done him wrong. Today, the Thunder Bay Police Service is under investigation itself. The Ontario agency that oversees complaints against police is reviewing how Thunder Bay handled the Debungi case, as well as allegations that racial discrimination is systemic. It was Dave Perry's report that launched that review, but he takes no satisfaction. The sad thing about Stacey Debungi is that this was an opportunity, and it's a missed opportunity for the Thunder Bay Police Service to start mending fences, building some trust. Had they done a thorough investigation and been completely transparent, this could have been a huge win. But that's an opportunity that's lost. I think no matter what they do now, it's too late. Does the Debungi family, are they owed an apology at this point? For the fact that one year later, they still have no answers from 
your police force? I think once we see the outcomes of, of the investigations, we'll, we'll basically go from there and, and decide if that's something that we need to do. If our investigation was problematic and we could have done a better job, yes. But for Brad the Bungie, an apology isn't the point. What he still wants a year later is to know. No, nothing's going to bring him back. So why don't you just let it go? Closure. I need closure. Family needs closure. To really know what happened to him. If he really did drown, I'll accept it. But my suspicion and what I feel is not right.